Hey, Pastor Rob here. Just wanted to thank you for checking out our messages online and wanted to encourage you. I pray that your soul is nourished through the hearing of the word. But at the same time, the writer of Hebrews is very clear about uh, not giving up meeting together. Don't give up the larger gathering. As a matter of fact, in the book of Acts, the early church made it a point to meet together almost daily even, breaking bread together, encouraging one another, being in communion with one another to build each other up. And, and that is vitally important to your spiritual walk. So I pray that you enjoy this message, but at the same time, I pray that you find a great church body to be a part of, whether that be here at the bridge or somewhere else, so that you can be built up as well. Thank you and God bless. How are we doing church? We feeling awake, feeling alive? Woo! I don't know how you can't be after that. I'll tell you what. Uh, man, thank you worship team for an excellent, excellent set this morning. And uh, man, uh, we were made for more. Amen. God's got bigger plans for us than to just be tending a grave and, and worrying about, even today. Um, uh, this week I was reminded, I was actually talking to my wife, and, and I just, I had to remind her, and, and she's had done this to me a no, number of times, what does, what, does, what does worry add to our life? It adds nothing, amen? And uh, God's got big plans that he wants to do in us that are way beyond this world and way beyond this life, and uh, man, I'm just so thankful to be here. Guys, it's Sunday. Are you excited to be in church? Heck yeah, I'm so excited to be here and so glad to have you with us. Um, uh, I know this is kind of our smaller service, but man, we gotta, I, I appreciate you guys waking up and being here. Um, uh, we need more people to come to first service, so if you can, invite your friends, say, hey, we need more people in first service. Will you come to first service? Will you get up early with me and come to church with me on Sunday morning? I'd love to see this service fill out more, uh, especially as the fall comes around. Hopefully we'll see a lot more people coming back from vacation and things like that, and we'll start to see this service fill out a bit more. Not only so that we can have more energy in this service, but also because we're always looking um, for ways to make more room in the other services. So thank you, thank you, thank you for coming to first service. I am so glad that you're here, and uh, man, I, I really appreciate um, all that you guys are and all that you do. So uh, guys, this week we're jumping into week two of a series that we jumped into last week, and this is, the, the, this is week two and also the final week of the series that we uh, started uh, called How to Study the Bible, and it's just a short mini-series that we kicked off last week to kind of help people understand what it means to really, really dig into Scripture and understand what it is they're reading because um, I don't know if you know this, but this book that we dive into every single week is a more than 2,000 year old text and, and it's written originally in the Hebrew and in the Greek and the Aramaic and so it's, it can be hard to understand sometimes, right? I don't know how many of you would admit, you know what, there are times where I open the Bible and I just don't know what, I, what it's even talking about. Can we just all raise our hands and admit that, right? There have been moments in time where we're just like, I'm not sure what they're getting at here. I don't know what this is written about. I don't understand what I'm reading, and uh, man, um, today I'm really, really excited to, to kind of help you continue to learn how to understand Scripture, and I want to highly, highly, highly suggest one thing before we jump in this morning. If you me missed week one, please do yourself a favor and get online and go watch it on our YouTube page, okay? Um, if you haven't started following our YouTube page, you can find it at our website. But man, that is the easiest way to listen to our sermons and, and what you missed from last week is going to be vitally important as we jump into this week. I'm going to do the best I can to kind of review and kind of help you understand where we've been. But man, if you don't go back to last week, it's going to be hard hard to, to connect with what we're getting into this week, okay? So uh, um, why don't we do this? Why don't we pray? And then we will get into the living word of God this morning. Lord, we love you. <clears throat> we thank you for the opportunity to be in service today, Lord. And I do not take for granted um, our worship team. I do not take for granted our welcome team. I do not take for granted our kids team. I do not take for granted this church that you've given us to freely worship in. Um, God, these people that are sitting in this room that, that are here to hear your message and your word and your way, Lord, I, I pray that they would be transformed by it. I pray that we would all be transformed by it, myself including, and God, that you would just continue, continue, continue to do good works in and through us as a church, Lord. Help us, help us to, as I pray so often, not just make this another Sunday, but, but Lord, may your Holy Spirit transform us more and more and more into the likeness of your son Jesus as we dig into the living word that you've given us. Um, may we not take it for granted. And we be, may we be moved by it this morning. In the name of your son, Jesus, we pray. And all God's people said, in the beginning was the word. 
And the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became what? Flesh, him who is Jesus and made his dwelling among us. The Word is a living and active thing as much as it is a book that we read, amen? As a matter of fact, Paul said to Timothy, all Scripture, everybody say all, all Scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching. It is it is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. According to the inspired word of God, what is the word? Well, if you go and look throughout all of Scripture, you find out that the word of God is a sword that pierces the heart. The Word of God is a light that shines in the darkness. It is a mirror that reveals who we truly are when we open it and, re- and read it with the right heart set and mindset. It is, it's a path to purity that we might find the way of Jesus that He's called us to, that we might find a clean life. It is a meal that nourishes. I love what one of my pastor, pastor friends said. He said, the Word is like a fresh drink of water in a desert. Right? Why do we read the Bible over and over and over again? Because for the same reason, we need a drink of water each and every single day. It is the living water. It is the living word that we need in us. It is a meal that nourishes. It is a seed that reproduces, it says in 1 Peter. It's a fire that consumes us. It's a defense against temptation. It's a source of faith. And it is the truth that lives for de- forever. Today, we open the word of God in many parts of the world um, that we don't live in, Christians actually fight to get into the Word of God. In certain parts of the world, you can be killed for getting into the Word of God. In certain parts of the world, there are different pieces of the Bible that that are confused and mistaken and get fought over. Um, in certain parts of the world, they have to hide their Bibles as they try to read them. But we. We, in in North America, we have free access to the Word of God. We have free access to it. All you have to do is go to a hotel, and they always have what? They have usually a Gideon Bible sitting in every single dresser or nightstand of that hotel room. We are so inundated with resources and things that we can have in order to read and study Scripture, and not only that, but we have most of us in our houses probably at least have a Bible somewhere in our bookshelf. Even if if you're not a believer, there are a lot of Americans that that don't believe in God, but they have a copy of the King James Version of the Bible in their library. Um, Not only that, but we live in a world where we can get any information from anyone, from anywhere, by simply using our smart devices. And yet, we take it for granted so very often, don't we? We take it for so very granted so very often. Something that I said last week was, it is the most valuable tool never used. It is the most valuable book almost never read. Now, why don't people read it? Why why don't they read it and study it and let it feed them? Why why is God's living word so neglected? Well, in, in some cases, some of us, if we're honest, if we're really, really honest, we just don't care to read it. It's troubling. It takes time to do so, and it's going to require work. Um, I, I know the, the number one thing I get from guys when we're talking to men about reading the Bible is, well, I just don't like to read. I just don't enjoy reading. It's just not something that I enjoy doing. Some of us uh, uh, don't read it because we don't believe it. Some of us don't read it because it doesn't apply to us. Some of us have tried to read it and we've gotten bored or we didn't understand what we were reading. And many of us, for the most part, just don't know how. And that's the biggest reason that I tend to come across as to why we don't read the scriptures. And so what we're doing is we're spending the next couple, we, we, we're, we, we've spent last week and this week uh, um, learning how to study the Bible through the book of Philemon. And if I were to give you a phrase that is most important throughout this, these two weeks, it would be this. And I don't want you to miss this. And if you're taking notes, this is what you're going to want to write down. And I want you to circle it a hundred times, okay? Because if you miss this point, you will never be inspired to get into Scripture. Do you hear what I'm saying this morning? 
This is what you need to hear this morning. The Bible is meant to transform us, not just inform us. Can I say that again? The Bible is meant to transform you. It's not just there to tell you about biblical history. It's meant to pierce the heart like we talked about a minute ago as the sword does. 1 Corinthians, Paul said this. He said, while knowledge makes us feel important, it is the love that strengthens the the church. It, It is love that strengthens the church. Where do we get love from? Where do we truly understand what love actually is? We get it from his word, from the God who is love. I love what Rick Warren said. He said, the Bible should give us a bigger heart, not a bigger head. That's what Scripture's for. It's not just about taking in knowledge. It's about transforming who we are from the heart to everything else that we are. James said it this way. He said, do not merely listen to the Word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Can we just read that last part together? Do what it says. The Bible is meant to transform you, not just inform you. Well, last week we jumped into like how to study the Bible, because many of us, when we, when we jump into Scripture, um, if we're honest, we, 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 we might admit that, you know what, the first time I read the Bible, I just decided to read it from beginning to end, right? So we, we read in Genesis, and it was really good, and we read a bunch of stories that were familiar to us, maybe even some stories that we remember reading and, or, and talking about in Sunday school as kids, but then we got to Exodus, and it kind of slowed down a bit, and then we got to Leviticus, and we all died, right? Like, we got confused, we got bored, we didn't understand, it didn't feel applicable, And so we tried to give you some strategies as to what it means to jump into the Word because while that method doesn't work, the lucky dip method doesn't work either, right? We talked about the lucky dip method. Well, Lord, I just want you to tell me what my scripture passage is. We take our Bibles, we close our eyes, we we, we, we flip to a specific page that we don't know anything about and we just drop our finger in and go, okay, God, let me read this, right? And it doesn't work that way. And so, so we said, okay, what's the most effective way to get into the Word? Well, here, here's what we talked about last week. The first thing you need to do is you need to tr- choose a translation you understand. Here at the bridge, we always tell everybody, especially new believers, we go through the New Living Translation because that's the easiest to understand we find here at the bridge. Um, the NLT and the NIV, the New Living Translation or the New International Version, are the two that we dig into the most. But then we need to choose a time, a place, and a plan to study. This is a big one. This is probably the biggest reason that we don't get into Scripture is because we don't have a time, a place, and a plan. We're going to talk about that more in a minute. Then we need to understand the context, right? And the best and easiest way to understand context is to get a study Bible. I've actually made it a point to preach out of my study Bible this week because I wanted to remind you guys the importance of owning a study Bible. If you're a follower of Jesus, you should have a study Bible in your home. You can go to Amazon. You can find a great study Bible on Amazon for about 40 to 50 bucks. Well, wow, Rob, that's a lot of money. Yeah, you're investing in eternity. Can I say that again? You're investing in eternity. And you're going to have this thing for a very long time. And and I don't know if there's anything worth investing in more. So grab... Grab a study Bible. I'll tell you the one that we recommend. I said it about 17 times last week. I'll say it about 17 times this week. We recommend the New Living Translation Life Application Study Bible. New Living Translation Life Application Study Bible. Because that's the easiest way to understand context. There's also other resources that you can use. If you go back to last week's sermon, you can dig into it. Okay? But then we need to read slowly and ask questions. We need to take our time. We need to dig. Don't feel like you have to read an entire book of the Bible when you sit down. Your pastor reads about a chapter or two a day as he studies, and it takes him about half hour to 45 minutes to actually get a good amount of study time and a good amount of time with the Lord. And then lastly, and most importantly, you need to pray for God to speak to you because you're not just there to get information, you're here to hear, you're you're there to hear from the living God, amen? I would say take number five there and put it as number one as well. Do both. Pray before you dig in. And pray after you dig in. Pray before you dig in and after you dig in. If you're looking for more resources, here's an awesome QR code for you to check out, okay? Um, The reason I put this on the screen is because uh, uh, the the church that we actually took this series from, yes, that's right, this series is not a series that I wrote myself. We actually took it from a church called Life Church. They have an awesome amount of resources for you to grab and use and, and, and help you understand the message and the Word of God. So if you want a 
bunch of resources at, at, at your palm and use this QR code and you can dig in pretty quickly and pretty aptly, okay? But the point is this, the point is this, is that we're, we're hoping by today you've already found a translation that you understand and that you maybe might start studying the Bible. But here's the thing, if you don't start digging in, if you don't start making a time, place, and plan, then you will not do it. While intentions are always good, actions are what define us. Can I say that again? While intentions are always good, our actions are what define us. What time have you set aside to get into the Word of God? I told you guys last week, if you're going to set aside a time, I think it needs to be the first thing in your day. Why? Because if you, number one, because the Bible talks about how God gets our first fruits, or what fruits? our first fruits, and not only that, but if we don't give him our first fruits and we push it off to the other side of the day, we're going to have a million things going through our brain, a million things going through our head, and it's most likely going to get run over and you're not going to have time to do it a lot of days. So I recommend that you do it first. Do you have to do it first? No. I understand that a lot of us have different situations, and God's not sitting here going, oh, he he didn't study his Bible first, he did it after the kids went to bed, right? Like God's not doing that. But I'm saying that's the easiest way to have a consistent study life. There are very few people, very few people I know, that have a consistent time with God or time in the Bible that don't do it first. Do you hear me, church? Do you have a place? Where's your spot? Mine's at my kitchen table. I was talking to Amber Deverell, our, uh, our administrator. She said, I have a chair next to our back window. It's this big, giant bay window. I could see out the backyard. And some days she sees deer in her backyard and things like that. While she's reading the Bible, it's this beautiful setting. She has her cup of coffee. Like, it's exactly where she wants it to be. Where is your place? Do you have it set aside? Do you have it prepared the night before so that when you wake up in the morning, you're reminded, hey, oh, yeah, I need to do that first. And do you have a plan? What's your plan? What are you doing to plan out what it means, what you're going to execute as it pertains to reading the Bible? Now, here's the thing. As it, this is what I want to talk about today, and this is what we're going to kind of dig into a bit, is what, what different kinds of plans we can have as it pertains to studying the Bible, okay? So the first thing you need to know as it pertains to a plan is this, as you try to figure out what your plan's going to be or what your plan is, can I just tell you this? There is no best plan. There is no best plan. There's no silver bullet. There's not, hey, this works for every single person. There's no best plan to study the Bible. Do I think there's a best study time? Yes, I think it's in the mornings, but there's no best plan. And what you need to know is this, is that every time you study, especially let me talk to the ladies for a minute, it doesn't have to be Instagrammable, okay? Like, like, you know how, how many of the girls, like, especially, you know, the super Christian girls, they like to post, oh, I got my Bible and my cup of coffee, and it just looks so good, and like, just can't wait to dive into the Word of the Lord, right? Like, how many of us have seen those Facebook posts? A few of us? Okay, right? It doesn't have to be Instagrammable. It doesn't. Now, if that's your thing, and that makes you feel warm and fuzzy inside so you can connect with the Lord, then sure, go ahead and make it Instagrammable, but it doesn't have to be perfect. I know a lot of friends that I have that what they do is they drive to work early and they sit in their car and read their Bible before they walk inside. That's their plan. That's their place. That's their time. And it doesn't have to be a certain amount of time either. For some of us, our study time is five minutes. For some of us, our study time is a half hour. For some of us, our study time takes an hour. What matters most is that you're doing something to get into the Word. Now, would I recommend that you spend at least a half an hour? Yeah, I think you should spend at least a half an hour communing with your Heavenly Father. There's 24 hours in a day. The least we can do is give Him a half hour, amen? But here's here's the only bad plan that you can come across. No plan. The only bad plan you could ever have is to have no plan. So, so let me give you five different ways that you can actually dig into Scripture and start studying the Bible and, and, and understanding what it exactly it is you're reading, okay? Um, the first way that you can study the Bible is you can start with a book of the Bible. Just start breaking down an entire book all at once. I want to study this book. I want to dig into this book. I want to understand everything that there is to know about it. I want to read all of my study notes. I want to read the in my study Bible. There's a 
always two or three pages before I get into the book that kind of set the context and get, tell me who the author is and what it's all about. And so I'm going to read that too, and I'm going to really, really dig in to the Bible. When you decide to start with a book of the Bible, maybe you're like, I want to know what God's original intentions for mankind are, so I'm going to read the book of Genesis. Because I know and understand that in Genesis, I see what God's original plan was for us all. And so we read through Genesis and maybe even in Exodus. But maybe, um, may, maybe you start with the book of John. A lot of people recommend that when you get into the Bible, the best place to start is in the book of John because it's the most powerful gospel as it pertains to who Jesus is and what he did for you that you might find freedom. When I think of the book of John, I think of the most graphic interpretation of the crucifixion of Christ. The book of John goes into the most detail as it pertains to the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. If you truly want to comprehend and understand what it is that Jesus did for you, I would recommend that you read the book of John. But I'm going to warn you, the chapters are long. <laughs> Maybe you're looking for wisdom. Practical wisdom, tactile wisdom, right? I'm, I'm a very practical guy. Um, you'll notice a lot of the, my messages aren't as spiritual as they are practical in a lot of ways. And, and I know that sounds horrible, but it's just true. I'm an extremely practical person. Um, I have a friend named Leslie who's a very philosophical person, and him and I complement each other because he always makes me think more on the philosophical end of things while I think, help him think more on the practical side of things, right? If you get into Proverbs and the book of James, you will get into the nitty-gritty practical wisdom side of faith. Maybe you're hurting, and you need comfort and inspiration. Maybe, maybe you're somebody who really, really appreciates worship and music and, and wants to, to truly be, have your soul fed through something along those lines. I would tell you to read the book of Psalms. This is actually one of the things that I want to do eventually. Pastor Eric wrote about it in our newsletter this last, last week. He's been studying the book of Psalms this last year. And, I, and that's something I've, I've always wanted to dive into. And, or maybe you're somebody who's like, you know what? I would just want to get real deep into thick theology, right? I would tell you to read the book of Romans. The book of Romans will mess you up. <laughs> it will mess you up. It's about gospel and sin and salvation. It is not light in the least of ways. It is a thick theological text that you're going to have to spend some time on. Start with the book of the Bible. This year I've been, as you guys have known, if you've been here, I've been studying the book of Jeremiah for more than six months now. I've learned so much about the, the end of Israel. And not only that, as horrible as it sounds, how often I've read that and gone, man, that's exactly where America's at right now. <laughs> and I'm not trying to be morbid or anything or scare you, but like, there are so many parallels between the book of Jeremiah and our current context today. All right, so start with the book of Bible. Maybe, maybe you decide to do something different. Maybe you decide to study a person of the Bible, right? If you're a woman, I would encourage you to read the books of Ruth or Esther because there, there's, there are these incredible stories about how God used women to change legacies and nations and futures of people. Maybe you study Elijah, who spent most of his time in the wilderness. Maybe you're in a dry land of your life, and you need, you need some encouragement as it pertains to the wilderness that you're in right now. Maybe you study First and Second Peter. First and Second Peter are very much akin, again, to Jeremiah. There are so many things going on during the time of Rome in the books of First and Second Peter that we can relate to on a practical level. So you can study a book of the Bible, you can study a person of the Bible, or you can study a topic of the Bible. You can study a topic of the Bible. Maybe you're, you're someone who needs to study grace more often because you're struggling with people that are legalistic in your life. Maybe you're somebody that's struggling with anxiety on a very high level and you need some encouragement as it pertains to that. Can I encourage you to grab something called a concordance? If you get in a concordance, you can actually look up specific words in the Bible and find all the passages that include that word. Anxiety. Okay, anxious. I'm going to look up what passages come up when it comes to that. 
specifically, I think about a passage. I think it's in Philippians. I could have this wrong, though. Um, forgive me on the reference. But it says, do not be anxious about anything, but by, in everything, by prayer and petition, present your request to God. You were not meant to live an anxious life. You were not meant to live an anxious life. Maybe you're struggling with some sin, with, with, with lust or, or integrity of some kind. Maybe you need to dig into more passages that talk about how to deal with temptation. You can study a topic of the Bible. You can do a, a daily devotional or, or, or a version Bible plan, Right? A lot of us love to do this. My wife loves to do this. Can I recommend a website to you? Um, there's an awesome website called Daily Grace Co. Okay, just Google it. It'll come right up. It'll be the first thing on your, uh, on your list. I don't know exactly what the website is, but I think it might be dailygraceco.com, but I'm not sure. Just Google Daily Grace Co. There are phenomenal daily devotional plans that you can order, and they, 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 they dig deep into the scripture. They give you context. They ask great questions most of the time. Daily Grace Co. is an amazing devotional resource that my wife absolutely loves. And her and I have done studies and devotionals uh, through that together as well. But then here, there are some more popular ones that many of you have probably heard of. Jesus Calling is a huge book that I know has spoken to a lot of people. It's a really quick devotional that you can dig into. I always like to recommend if you're going to get into Jesus Calling, make sure that you're also maybe digging into Scripture a little bit. Because Jesus Calling is like a really short one-day devotional. And you don't really spend that much time reading it. It literally takes less than five minutes to read. And so I would encourage you to do something in addition to that. There's also uh, an awesome devotional by Oswald Chambers called My Utmost for His Highest. I have not dug in, into that one or this next one by Craig Rochelle called Daily Power, but I've heard great things about them. Um, maybe you get into a daily devotional book that, you know, you just kind of put the phone away, set it aside so you can't be distracted by it. In my case, I have to take off my smartwatch so it doesn't bother me either, right? And just dig into the Word for the morning through the eyes of someone else who's already dug into it for you, right? Or you can go to version If you've got your version Bible app, there are, I think there's 3,000 plus different devotionals you can dive into on version. Anybody ever done a version devotional? Raise your hand. Okay, so a lot of us, right? Just an awesome, awesome way to dig, get, dig into Scripture. And the thing I love most about version is that you get reminders. Like you can set it up so it reminds you, hey, don't forget to do your devotions today, right? Um, uh, you can do a, a, a daily devotional or you can do a version plan, okay, guys? We're kind of getting to the practical, the nitty-gritty. I'm not trying to bore you with all this, but, but I really, really want you to understand that there are so many different ways that you can dive into Scripture. And then here's probably the most difficult one, and this is one that I'll be honest with you, as your pastor, I have yet to do, and I'll probably do within the next few years here. This is a goal of mine, and this is you can read through the whole Bible. And what I mean by that is there are actually Bibles and devotionals that you can do that are called Read the Bible in a Year. You can go through the entire Bible in one year, and I've been told that when you do this, man, it just gives you a full picture of the story of Christ, and you can see it from Genesis all the way to Re Revelation. It's incredible. Um, and you, maybe you don't, want, you don't have to do it in an entire year. Maybe you just make the decision, I'm just going to read through the whole Bible, and that's okay. But here's, here's something, let me just give you a tip here, okay? There's all these different strategies that you can use, all these different things that you can do, but, but what you need to know is this, is that if what you're doing isn't working, you need to change the plan. If what you're doing isn't motivating you, isn't inspiring you, if it feels dry, if it's not working after a few weeks or a few months, it's okay to change the plan. There are seasons of my life where I do something called soap journaling, which we've talked about in the past. I'm not going to get into that today, where I just read a scripture of, uh, of the Bible, uh, passage in the Bible, and then, then I write in my journal about it, uh, a, a short entry. <clears throat> but then there are other days where I'm like, you know what, there are other seasons of my life, excuse me, where I'm like, you know what, that just isn't working, that's not connecting with me, so I'm going to do something else. And so I'll do a version Bible plan. Or I'll do a podcast that talks about the Bible. Or I'll do a video devotional, which you can actually find those on YouTube. Or version as well. There's video devotionals. Like, I'm just, I haven't, I'm just not feeling like reading right now because at work I've been reading like crazy. And so I just, I just want to do a video devotional to kind of give my eyes and my mind a break. If what you're doing isn't working, don't be afraid to change the plan. All right, so church, church, listen to me. 
what can you do to wake up tomorrow morning with a plan? When, where, and what am I going to study? If you're taking notes, I want you to write those three words down. When, where, and what. And put colons next to each one. When, where, and what. And this week, I want you to fill that in. I'm going to make sure every day, okay, I go to work at 9. I'm going to be showered and ready to go by by 8. So that's my win. Okay, I'm going to I'm going to sit in my recliner next to the window, right? And what am I going to study, man? I've really been want I've been talking about studying this book of the Bible for I don't know how long. I'm going to finally do it. Right? I've had this devotional sitting on myself for I don't know how long and I'm finally just going I'm going to pull it off the shelf and gosh dang it, I'm going to dig into it. It's time to stop saying, well, I should. Well, I want to. Well, I'm going to. Find a good translation, have a place and a plan, okay? All right, so let's, let's look back at Philemon. That's, that's the book of the Bible we've been, in, we've been in, and I know it took us a long time to get here, guys, but as we dig into Philemon this morning, uh, um, uh, <clears throat> this is what I want us to ask these questions, okay? We want to go back to our context questions. Who wrote it? Um, uh, to whom was it written? And, and what was the purpose, okay? So we're studying a book of the Bible. That's the strategy that we chose, and specifically, we're in the book of Philemon. So if you have your Bibles with you, you can go ahead and turn there now if you haven't already, okay? Um, and if you don't have a Bible with you or an app for that you can grab a black Bible from the chair racks in front of you, or you can download U version. I don't want to rush through this too quickly, but but man, mate, let's let's be ready to dig into the Word, okay? And, and, and as we prepare, let's make sure we understand the context from last week, okay? So we want to know who wrote it, um, to whom it was written, and what was it? What was the purpose, okay? Well, the first pr- thing we know is that Paul wrote it, right? Paul wrote Philemon, the w- the book of Philemon, to Philemon because it wasn't really a book; it was a letter. It was a letter, right? Now, what do we know about Philemon? Well, we know throughout um, context and through what we read and through some, some, some different studies that we've gone through that, that Philemon was a businessman, that he was an owner of a business in some way or another, that, that Paul led Philemon to know who Christ is. And not only that, but Philemon has been hosting church in his home. Some of you guys are nervous about hosting a life group. Imagine hosting an entire church service. Okay, Philemon has been hosting church in his home, and this whole letter is about a slave named, does anybody remember his name? Onesimus. Onesimus. Now, why is Paul writing about Onesimus? Well, Onesimus stole from Philemon. He was actually Philemon's slave who stole from him and escaped to Rome. And Onesimus met Paul in Rome, and as he was in prison in Rome, he met Onesimus, and Onesimus um, confessed his sin to Paul, and Paul ended up leading Onesimus to Christ, which is this just this crazy thing, and Onesimus is getting out of jail, and, and now Paul's writing this letter to Philemon. Well, why? What's the purpose? Well, Paul's, what, what's, what's, what's Paul asking Philemon to do? He's asking Philemon to Forgive Onesimus. Okay, so we've got to understand the context. We need to read slowly and ask questions, and we need to pray for God to speak to us. Lord, as we dig into your word this morning, may you speak to our hearts, our souls, our minds, and our spirits. May you transform us, God, not just inform us. In the name of your son, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Verse 12. Philemon, verse 12. I'm sending him back to you, Onesimus, and with him comes my own heart. I wanted to keep him here with me while I'm in these chains for preaching the good news, and he would have helped me on your behalf, but I didn't want to do anything without your consent. I wanted to help you, well, excuse me, I wanted you to help because you were willing, not because you were being forced, Paul says. Paul's full of character integrity. Verse 15, it seems you lost Onesimus for a little while so that you could have him back forever. In other words, God allowed Onesimus to run away, but that's because he had a bigger plan, amen? So that you could have him back forever. He's no longer like a slave to you. He's more than a slave, for he is a beloved brother, especially to me. Now he will mean so much more to you, both as a man and as a brother 
and the Lord. Okay, so, so Paul's saying, listen, God has been working in, in this whole thing. Like, I know you were angry and upset that Onesimus left, but he was working out something bigger and better. Do you see it, Philemon? Do you see what he's doing? And then we get to verse 18, and it says this, If Onesimus has done any wrong or owes you anything, charge it to me. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand, and I will pay it back. And it, a lot of us, if we look at that scripture passage there, you can see it's got emphasis. Maybe it's completely capitalized in your Bible. I, I, that's to note that like the handwriting changed there. right? Because usually Paul had someone recording for him. But at that point in time, Paul was like, I need you to know this is me, right? I need you to know this is me. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I will pay it back, not to mention, uh, not to mention that you owe me your very self. Paul says, I will pay a debt I do not owe. Kind of reminds me of the gospel. When you go to Isaiah 53, it says this, Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Who is he? Jesus. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that, was brought, that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. I will pay a debt that I do not owe. The debt we owed, Jesus paid. Whatever we needed, he provided. This is something we need to understand, that the Bible isn't about you. It's about God's love for the world, um, uh, 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 redemption through Jesus, right? It's about redemption through Jesus. The Bible's not about you, however, it was written to you. While the Bible's not about you, it was written to you, and since, um, uh, since it was written to you, it's helpful sometimes when you're reading through Scripture to, to ask yourself, where do I fit in this story? Where do I fit in this story? <clears throat> As we look at this passage in Philemon, I would ask you this question, which person do you relate to the most? Which person do you relate to the most? Do you relate to Paul, who's taking a risk on someone? He's taking a risk on Onesimus. He's saying, hey, I'm going to set you free. I'm not going to let you be branded as a slave or as a fugitive, but I'm trusting that you're going to go back to, to your owner. I'm going to trust that you're going to go back to Philemon. Or maybe you relate to Onesimus, who needs forgiveness himself. You know that you've wronged someone. You know that you've sinned. You know that you've broken a relationship, and you you you. It's your time to seek forgiveness. Or maybe, maybe you're, you're like Philemon who's being called to forgive. Which one do you relate to? If you read in Philemon um, three different times, you might get three different things every time you read it. You might be at three different points in your life, and at each point you might relate to each of these people. And God might speak to you in three different ways. What did I say? The word of God is like a fresh drink of water in a desert. You can read the same thing at different points in your life and get completely different things from the Lord. One time you read it, you might be more like Paul, who's taking a risk on somebody. Maybe God's put a person in your life who needs you to believe in them. And they may not be like Onesimus. They may fail you. But God's calling you to take a risk anyway. Maybe another time you read it and you relate to Onesimus. You've committed the sin and it's time for you to confess it. Can I tell you, I was leading a men's group this summer and the most powerful session we probably had as a group was the session where we broke up into small groups and said, hey, the Lord has been convicting you of something and you need to confess it to your brother. Because there's something that happens when you don't just confess it to the Lord but to the man next to you. Maybe you lost your temper on somebody. Maybe you lied to someone you love. Maybe you're trapped in some addiction. I don't know what it is for you, and it's time for you to confess. Maybe, maybe you can look up in a concordance the word forgiveness from God, and, and, and then you'll come across 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, God is faithful 
and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Or maybe, maybe you relate to Philemon. Maybe somebody hurt you. Maybe somebody betrayed you. Maybe somebody stabbed you in the back. Maybe, maybe someone you admired took advantage of you. What do they say? Don't meet your heroes. Maybe there's someone you need to offer forgiveness to. Maybe, maybe God's calling you to forgive, but you don't want to. Remember the context of Philemon? Onesimus stole from Philemon. He didn't just run from him. He stole from him. And Philemon had the right to brand his forehead with an F, which stands for fugitivus, the word we get the word fugitive, right? He had the right to beat him in Roman society. He had the right to execute Onesimus within Roman society. And yet Paul said, don't receive him as a slave, but rather receive him as a brother. Maybe you, you search up in your YouVersion Bible app the word forgive and you come across Ephesians chapter 4 where it says, Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you. It's much easier to forgive when you're looking up to him rather than down on others. Can I say that again? It is much easier to forgive when you're looking up at God rather than down on others. Maybe God is calling you to forgive someone. What is God showing you? The Bible isn't meant to inform us, it's meant to transform us. Here's the thing, if you start digging into the context of the book of Philemon, if you start digging into the history and even the time thereafter, if you fast forward 50 years from the, the time that the book of Philemon was written, you actually come across this guy named Ignatius of Antioch. Okay, and this is where it just gets extremely real and awesome and cool, okay? And if you come across this man who was known as Ignatius of Antioch, or otherwise known as the Bishop of Antioch, you come to understand that Ignatius was actually a famous martyr within, this, within the history of Christianity. And not only was Ignatius a bishop during this time, and was he a famous martyr? But many scholars actually believe that Ignatius was discipled by John himself. The Apostle John, the most beloved John of whom Jesus was closest to. Ignatius um, uh, wrote a letter to a church in Ephesus. And, and in this letter, Ignatius brags about this bishop that they have in Ephesus that just blew him away when he was there. And he starts talking about this bishop and he says things like, man, he, he calls this bishop a man of inexpressible love. And he says, blessed be God who granted unto you such an excellent bishop. So this bishop named Ignatius can't stop talking about this other bishop that was absolutely incredible and lovely and amazing. Do you know what that bishop's name was? Onesimus. Now, we don't know, and we can't confirm it completely, but most scholars agree that according to the time and date of Philemon when it was written, as well as the time and date of Ignatius, that, that many scholars believe that this is the same Onesimus that Paul called Philemon to forgive and to start treating as a brother. Many believe that it's the same runaway slave that was changed by Jesus. I don't know about you, but that gives me goosebumps. Amen? What will God's word do in your life? Well, the answer is that depends on what you need. If you're hurting, he will bring you hope. If you're lost, he will give you direction. If you're doubting, he will build your faith. Because why? Because faith comes by hearing, not just by seeing. If you're anxious, God's word 
tells you to cast your anxiety on him, to cast your cares on him that you might find peace. If you're trapped in a life you never wanted, God's truth can set you free. I love God's word. I need God's word. I depend on God's word to do great things in me. His word is what has saved me on so many occasions, church. It's what gives me wisdom throughout every single day. It's what sustains me. And, and I want you to know and love God's word. And so this is what I'm asking for. This is what I'm, I'm asking you to step into. Um, as we think about God's word, as we step into this next season as a church, as we run towards the fall and, and expect God to do what only he can do, I'm asking you to make a commitment. I'm asking you to step forward and say, you know what, I'm going to step up finally as it pertains to reading my Bible. I'm going to dig into the Word of God on not just occasional basis, but on a weekly basis, on a daily basis. And so, so here's the thing. I, I'm calling you as a church, I'm calling all of us as a church to make a commitment. Lord, I'm going to make a better effort to get into the living Word that you've given me. In my house, it will not be the most powerful tool never used. It will not be that. So I want to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes.